Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, we're going to get started in just a second here. Uh, so just wanted to say hello to start. First of all, uh, Tomas and I, this is our first time in Montreal. We've had a great weekend here. We came out on Friday and have been really enjoying the town. Hope you enjoyed uh, the California weather that we, that yeah, we, brought, we brought with some us. along with us. Uh, so we've been really enjoying the town, uh, wonderful restaurants and just really great sights and everything. Um, I wanted to start by asking a few questions of you guys and see... Uh, first of all, um, how many people in this room are audio professionals by a show of hands? Okay. How many people are students? Okay. And um, how many people are coming from other elements of game design? Uh, you know, maybe production or game, game creation? Okay. Very cool. <laughs> all right. That's, that's good. It, sounds, it seems like we have a good mix. Uh, also, um, did anyone ha have a chance to see maybe our play by sound talk from GDC by a show of hands? Okay, good. I'm actually glad not many people did because we'll recover. We'll be going through a lot of the same material, um, but we're going to do a much more deep dive on whys and how we used it. So um, even if you have seen that, there'll be a lot of new information here. Uh, but yeah, we'd, so we're here. We're really happy. Uh, we want to talk a bit about Overwatch itself. How many people in this room know about Overwatch or have played it? <laughs> um, all right. Well, that's great. So this next slide is going to be uh, really simple. So we just want to talk a little. It is a new game that's relatively new. Um, and uh, we came out just last month on the 24th, and uh, we want to just talk a bit about the world. It's a big, bright, vibrant, um, comic world uh, filled with just like, you know unique heroes and um, you know just giant uh, spectacle and sound uh, opportunities for us, which has been really great. Uh, so uh, you know, for those who don't know, it's a competitive team-based shooter, uh, unique heroes and abilities uh, with six v six gameplay. And it launched, like I said, just recently. Uh, we also just uh, hit a real unique mi milestone where we have 10 million players unique in the world, uh, which is pretty fast considering it's only been a few weeks. So <laughs> we're very, we're very um, humbly uh, excited and happy th to have reached that. So we're off to a good start. Now just to uh, show a little bit of uh, the game uh, for those of you who aren't super aware. Drop the beat! We are determination. We are. All right, so we're going to cut that a little bit short and uh, talk about how uh, the decision ma was made to uh, use Wise for Overwatch. So, um, for those of you not aware about uh, the history, uh, the, the project Overwatch was actually born uh, out of a much longer project that was uh, in process for a number of years called Project Titan. Um, it was an MMO that we were working on that never got released and got shut down in uh, 2013. And we had used uh, WISE earlier, and it was an obvious decision as, uh, for on us in the early days of that project um, when we were trying to determine what sort of software would be best. Uh, we have Tomas, who's a wonderfully talented audio programmer, and he with all his resources, um, while he would maybe you know could make his own audio software and own own audio engine, the wonderful breath that Wise brings was an obvious solution for us, and it allows us to sort of develop on top of that and build um, from this wonderful base feature set. Uh, is there anything you want to add, Tomas, about this? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, a fun fact is I joined Bl Blizzard six years ago, so out of the 10 years that Wise was out there as a project, s for six years we were working with it, and I think the sound uh, department really embraced it as a whole design tool. It's not that they create the sounds in um, their, their sound editors and then just import it, and it's just an implementation tool. It's a, it's a creative tool for them, guys. Mm -hmm. So they can iterate, they, they play the sounds in the tool, and I think we will show some of the workflow there. But um, since we then moved to Overwatch, we knew exactly that we wanted to keep WISE. We had an opportunity to essentially kick it out and try do it differently. Um, and I think there were much, much reasons that you hopefully we can get at to this um, presentation that you see why it was so helpful for us. Um, Simon promised us that we could um, be truthful and also maybe mention a few hiccups that we had in the, in the production with the tool. Some are self 
uh, emphasized through how our technology works, and I will get to that. But yeah. So uh, some interesting stats about the WISE project. Uh, it's very large. We have almost uh, 1,300 work unit files. Uh, so the reason that we did that was actually not so because uh, you know, it was absolutely necessary. It was because we had so many people working on the project at one time. So the more that we have of these work units, the less conflicts we run into between uh, our, our coworkers. Um, we organized the project, which I'll show you in a minute, um, by types of sounds, not by the first logical thing that you would think is like, oh, all the sounds from the hero would live in the same place in the project, which might be easier in some sense to think of it that way, um, but there's actual functional reasons that we ended up organizing it by the sound type. Uh, we've referenced uh, a ton of waves in the project, about uh, 14,300 reference waves um, that are actively being used, but then there's also all these secondary waves that WISE knows about, which totals 23,000. Um, it takes a while on an SSD to even to load all this data, so it's about uh, 55 seconds to click the button and until your project's ready to use. Um, and for as far as the team size goes, we had six sound designers, um, and that sort of changed uh, up and down throughout the course of uh, production. Uh, two music uh, engineer or two mu music composers, uh, programmer, uh, production support, and QA support. So we had a really, really good uh, team. We're lucky to be the ones here presenting, but this is all of our work that we're presenting here today. Um, so one of the things I want to do here is actually just jump over to uh, Wise and give you a little tour of how we set up the project. So if I click over here and go over. So the one thing you'll see, right, you know, I haven't collapsed this yet. There's a lot of hierarchy. So one thing we used a lot was this b ability to collapse all or expand. So, um, so that was something we would uh, get into a lot. So at the very top, um, when looking at the master mixer, uh, one decision that was made uh, actually very close to the end of the project was to break up um, our sounds into 2D or 3D sounds at this level being the first sort of junction point in the mixer. And I'll get more into why that is uh, when we talk about uh, the Dolby Atmos headphone technology. But for now, just you can kind of see that. And then there's submixes of music and sound effects. The aux buses are under the 2D. Under the 3D, there's sound, certain sound effects or dialogue here. Um, and you know, it's just generally uh, those two top level uh, buses. And like I said, I'll get back into all of this later so you'll see more of why we made that decision. Under the actor mixer hierarchy, there's uh, uh, user work units that we used a lot for things in progress, but those uh, were checked in, but generally no one else uh, needed to get into other people's users. Um, there's an ambience subfolder where we have all the ambience for a game that's, that's by type. You know, we have the beds or the emitters, um, the game objects. Uh, there's a cinematics work unit which we just play through um, some of our cinematic pieces. And then under sound effects is where the bulk of our um, project lies. Uh, you'll see that a lot of these uh, categories are, are mostly broken up into um, under abilities, you'll see a 1P and a 3P subdivision at the top. Um, what, I, what we mean by that is 1P are your sounds in first person or coming from you, and then three, uh, the 3P abilities are mostly the other player's abilities. Um, and we have that distinction all over the place so that we can bust separately at the top level. It's, this is where this um, idea of organizing by type of sound became really important because we set a lot of different um, properties right here. So under like, let's say look at 3P abilities, it gets bussed to the 3P abilities bus. We're sending a certain amount of this to a reverb. We're sending a certain amount to our quad delay, which you'll hear more about later. We are then driving certain RTPCs. Like there's a whole bunch of RTPCs that all of the sounds below this are gonna go through. There's an importance RTPC or obstruction, occlusion type parameters. And then everything that goes below this, we could basically bring sounds in very quickly and know that the base settings are more or less correct. You know, things like, uh, you know, our advanced settings, like our, our um, priority, which then gets modulated by an RTPC. All these things could be set up. So then we could just quickly go in, add a new ability for Bastion, and know that the really important settings are already where we want them to be. So um, that's not where we started. We started by having, like I said, these sort of centralized uh, locations like where all the bastion abilities and footsteps and everything were all in one folder, but we just were creating bugs all the time. Something wasn't bussed properly because someone was in a, cr in a hurry and didn't set it, or something had the wrong priorities. And if you wanted to just you know raise or lower the priority of something like a footstep, you'd have to go to f you know 
hundreds of different places in the project to accomplish that. When you organize it this way, you can really uh, consolidate your high-level property changes and um, you know, make it much more easy to tune. And that's something that we did a lot of, a lot of tuning, a lot of changes, um, especially in those, those top-level RTPCs. So then uh, if you go down, there's you know, UI work units, nothing super crazy in there. Um, and then voice. So we actually um, took most of our voice out of WISE into um, uh, using an, a thing called external sources. And that means that all the voice played through this one object right here. So this is our VO external voice. And it would do, I'll get more into this later, but it would ask a lot of questions about you know, what type of voice am I and then pr play back through uh, different mechanisms. And then finally, the last thing we have is uh, interactive music. Um, and all of those were divided into just two uh, switches. We had a, uh, Overwatch music, which handles all the major game state music. And then we had Overwatch stingers, which would handle these little short uh, musical overlays. So that's, the in a, in a nutshell, the very um, high level sort of view of how we organized the WISE project. Uh, I also want to show you a little bit of our um, editor. So this is something we call uh, TED. It's our um, engine. And there's a, a, a couple of really interesting things in here. Um, number one, we actually uh, don't hit the generate button in WISE to generate. We actually generate from here under something called the audio importer, which Tomas will talk more about in a That's second. That's why it's so ugly. It is a, it's a programmer uh, art a little bit. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> this, uh, this is how we actually generate it for WISE and get it into the engine. Um, so we can, we can save in the project, come in here, and it brings all the assets into the engine, uploads them for us, and allows us to do some really cool things. Um, there's other things like uh, sound space that we drop these into the different levels of the game. So you know, a room uh, in a map like Cairo might have you know, a set ambience down here. Um, it might have a certain aux bus, which is what, how we defined all of our reverbs and, and everything. Um, we might set a specific sound state when you're in there or a sound switch for certain aspects of, uh, say, a weapon tail uh, gunfire going from an indoor to an outdoor tail. That's all kind of managed through these decisions we make here. And then we could also do some other fancy stuff where we're, you know, low passing an external ambience or um, changing the volume to, to fit this specific use case um, when we place it in the level. So uh, there's other things that um, I'll br come back to here. This is our writer's tool. We have a whole section on this later in the presentation. Um, and there's a lot of other really interesting um, things that we did. So if you just look up sound in here, you'll see that there's all these different asset types. So we have things that are called sounds that are, um, uh, let me open it up real quick. So it's in addition to uh, it being a play or a stop event kind of rolled into one sort of object, it has other things like uh, obstruction occlusion factors or filters or ways that we allow calling or ways we pass in parameters to these sounds. But then there's also all these other sound properties or sound assets that are created in the game. Um, so there's you know the different aux buses or sound banks. All these exist in our engine as well as in Wise, and they get imported and uh, can be um, just by while you ha have that up. I, mm -hmm. I try to pull out these icons out of straight out of Wise. So the blue ones are our source assets, which are uh, wave files and work unit and the project. While the black icons are pretty much what the WISE tool presents, switches, switch groups, sound states, um, sound switches, and then VEM files and stuff. So we, we kind of duplicate all the data that WISE builds and um, mirror it in our database. Yeah. So uh, one of the cool things about the way our database works too is that it allows um, being able to get it there in that way. We have this, this sort of workflow where we have this local workflow server on your machine. and it enables us to iterate really quickly because we can build on our own machine and then immediately through our, our little tools tray icon, we can create a playtest and then invite 10, 12 other people to join on my playtest before I ever check in, listen to the new sounds, give feedback, and then, okay, everyone's good, then we check it in or we can, it, it allows a lot more freedom to iterate. So, so there's the level editor. Yeah. And here you go. That's me. Yeah. So um, welcome, thank you for coming. My name is Tomas. Um, what I want to talk about, and I tried to, is that the laser? Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the, the little bit of the homegrown problems that we created. Um, in Titan, we didn't have this local 
um, server database that we run on everyone's computer, but we were just consuming the data straight of the hard disk, which was great because we could build wise and, and do a hot reload in our game and we would pretty much uh, have the new sound data there immediately. Now, there was a bigger, higher up tech change and we had this concept of a database. And for that, I need to detect what does WISE build, um, run a big comparison, um, and then try to upload and check out all the stuff that needs to go into the database. And um, obviously, there, there are some parts of, of us where we decided to have that workflow. And I think uh, Scott just dis uh, explained how great that is for our project because we can iterate on it, we can, uh, we can iterate on something without it being checked in and other people have visibility on it so we don't pollute other people and waste their sync time and so on. So we can just really finalize something and then it goes in and, and it rolls out to everyone on the team. So with that having said, our, uh, how WISE builds it, it builds in a monolithic way, right? We have to always build the whole project because we don't know what change in a work unit uh, causes what change in banks and VEM files on, on the output side. And um, hopefully there is some uh, room there for improvement uh, in terms of output logs. I think the incremental build stuff that was introduced recently is really helpful and we, um, we haven't embedded that yet, but we are, we are looking forward to do that. Uh, but that's pretty much our audio pipeline. We have um, tools here where they, they, the sound designers create the WAV files, they manipulate it with WISE, that's the, that's the source data editors. These are our three asset types that we have, including our, um, we have a naming convention for uh, events. Events always start with a play underscore or a stop underscore, um, and then Audio Imposter builds that into what uh, Scott just showed in our um, world editor, um, where then these are sound assets um, this is a di so this, the, the sound term in WISE is slightly uh, different than our si sound term because this is just a thing that we hook up in an effect. So, so that's pretty much what I just said. We have a, a build process that is not in WISE. Um, we build through Audio Importer uh, by something called bank definition. So we tell WISE what banks to build. And we have essentially our logical granularity is one sound is a bank. So we don't collect, banks are not collections of sounds, like we have a single bank. And then what we do is we only put meta information in there, not media data. And I come to that, I think, later. And then we started through a command line property. Um, and the good thing about that is we always know that we built the project correctly. It's, it might take a little bit longer, but we had um, early on in the first one, two years, we had the problem that sound designers tried to be sneaky and they did the little checkbox on, on the F7 screen and then actually we committed bad banks. And that's a good step for us to uh, get over that. So, um, and then we compare the state of the local database with our audio assets on disk. That's what the, what the audio importer is doing. Now, as I said, our term of sound is something that belongs to an effect. Everything in Overwatch is an effect, essentially. It's a timeline. It might be particle effects, might be an animation, might be camera shake, whatever it is. Sound is actually not exposed to the game. Only effects are exposed to the game. And um, so we can put sounds on a timeline in an effect, and that's how we call sounds. And then to play a sound successfully, we need to load a little bit of data, obviously, and that is some metadata and some media data. And that, that li lives in a concept here at a runtime concept that's just called sound data. And for a given WISE version, we are on 2015, I don't even know. We have one bank which has the media data, uh, sorry, the, the metadata. So it's, this is a really small file, just a couple of kilobytes. And then we have a number of VEM files, how Emory, how the, the, the number of VEMs that are um, dependent on that sound is we just list them up here. And then we had a WISE upgrade and we said, oh, we're not sure if we want to have that WISE upgrade, but we don't want to interrupt the, the guys to work and we need time to QA that version. So then I expanded that so that we can have multiple WISE versions at the same time. Different clients just consume the WISE version that they, they need, 
but the asset system, our, our database that I was talked about, essentially had duplicating the asset. We had to duplicate all the banks, we had to duplicate all the VEMs, um, and then this was the, the statics um, portion, which was great. And then we introduced uh, multiple platforms, so we had support for PlayStation 4 and Xbox, and that means you know, we could have multiple WISE versions across multiple platforms, and then have we are just have this mess of data. And that's why our audio importer is also so slow, because if I compare them, I might need to compare it against, you know, hundreds of thousands of them, although we only ship uh, a certain number. And that's pretty much a little statistic. It's like a fun, fun, fun fact screen. We have uh, 5,400 uh, game sounds. On average, they have, like, roughly 11 sounds in it, like a little VEM files in it. Uh, the smallest one have one, the biggest one has 116, which by chance is the Winston peanut butter emote sound. So when he opens it and is all happy about opening a peanut butter, and what that is, is it in WISE, they just use the time, the, the time delay to just play 116 sounds, which I think is, is pretty clever and great, because otherwise they would need to go to our effect and create 116 sounds to kind of timeline it correctly. So they just do that in WISE, and that's pretty much this guy there. That's the, the peanut butter, butter sound. Um, but you see, overall, we are like somewhere around 20, and then here we are around 40. So then when we look at the VEM statistics, that's pretty much it. We have like a, around 14,000 individual media files. Um, in total, per platform, that's roughly 450 megabytes, um, 42,000 if we take all platforms in it, and then on average, every VEM is used roughly five times um, by a sound. And again, some sounds are only referenced by a single, um, some VEMs are only referenced by a single VEM, some are referenced 150 times, and that happens to be footsteps and 22. Because we, w it's just a little sound that is just we just throw it on every self, um, footstep sound. So VEM files are range uh, in size. The average is around 32 kilobyte. We have really small, very short sounds, and we ran into some encoder bugs where the sound was too short for the encoder to even create it. And then these are big ones, and again, that's our big music file in the end, the, the credits music. Um, that's, the, that's the big six and a half uh, megabyte sound. Uh, bank statistics, as I said, banks are sounds, so we have this identical number here. They only hold meta information, and um, usually they're pretty small, they are under 2K on average. The big one is actually the init bank, and in the last one and a half years I counted roughly 500 iterations on it, so I went in our source control. We also created our own source control plugin for WISE that connects to our database, and um, it had like a 500 history on it. And with that, back to Scott. Cool. Uh, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about Blizzard. Uh, you guys, uh, most of you I'm sure have heard of the company before, um, and it has a, a unique culture that I wanted to mention. Uh, so in our courtyard, there's this orc. Uh, he's about 14 feet tall, modeled in, in pure brass. When they clean him, they bring out a blowtorch to clean the guy off. Uh, and, and it's really interesting, and you may think it's just kind of like this um, you know, extravagant cost for the company, but it actually means a ton to the culture. Uh, around the base here, these are our core values, and each one is around the, the side of this. And having this cast in bronze um, in something in the center of the courtyard that we see every day, uh, there are all these values that we bring up over and over again. There's uh, things like learn and grow. You constantly hear people talking about this in meetings, or every voice matters. These are all things that, that people talk about, and they really influence the culture of the company. Um, one of the most important ones, if not the most important, is gameplay first. It's something that Blizzard has um, lived and died by, really, over the last 20, 22 years that they've been around. Um, the gameplay is hugely important to any Blizzard game. It, it, it takes precedence over how it looks, how it sounds. It's just, it needs to be fun. You need to enjoy the game that you're playing. And that may seem sometimes like an obvious thing, but there's, it's not as obvious as you sometimes always think. Um, so uh, we as Sound wanted to think a lot about how we could contribute to that. Um, and for us, uh, our audio, or our, sorry, our game director, J uh, Jeff Kaplan, uh, in the early days of Overwatch said, I want to be able to play the game by sound. I'm like, okay, that's, I mean, that's cool. It, it, it took a while for that to sink in what that meant. He says, 
that he wants so much information encoded in the sound that he could practically close his eyes or turn off the monitor and know what's going on at any given time. So um, that's something we really took to heart, and we thought a lot about it um, over these last many years. And what you're about to see in this presentation is um, a retrospective on kind of what we did to reach this goal. So uh, these pillars uh, are more just an organizational way to kind of subdivide this talk. We'll keep coming back to these. Um, but there's a number of things that really influenced the gameplay and made it so that you were a better player. Uh, so number one, we're going to talk a little bit about our inform informative hero VO and how they talk and give you a lot of information. Um, we're going to talk about our mix and what we did to keep that as clear as we could. We're going to talk about pinpoint accuracy, how we located our threats around us. Um, we're going to talk about the gameplay information that is encoded in the sounds themselves um, and music, which is something, unfortunately, we don't talk nearly enough about in this presentation. Um, and finally, a Pavlovian response is really kind of like the goal of all these things, that when you hear a sound, you can react as quickly as possible.